Good morning, good afternoon, good evening again. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you here today to, to this webinar on You That Work in the Green Economy. My name is Martha Meles and I'm a Senior Program Specialist at Canada's International Development Research Centre, or IDRC. For those who are not familiar with IDRC, IDRC is Canada's, uh, part of Canada's foreign affairs and development effort. We fund uh, knowledge, innovation, and solutions to address some of the most pressing challenges facing developing countries, youth employment being one. I'm joining you here today from our head office in Ottawa, Canada, situated in the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabe people. IDRC is pleased to partner with INCLUDE and the ILO on, to launch this webinar series on this very important topic of youth employment. The webinars bring together a very diverse group of key actors, including researchers, experts, practitioners, policymakers, and the youth themselves. The goal is really to facilitate knowledge sharing and also to build a community of practice in order to discuss actionable solutions where um, young women and men can, can chart out their future and can both be the beneficiaries and drivers of the sustainable and inclusive development. Why is this important? 70% of Africans are below the age of 30, making Africa the youngest continent in the world in terms of the proportion of its young people. If the current trend prevails, it is estimated by 2040, Africa will have the largest workforce in the world, surpassing both China and India. So harnessing this potential will be key to shaping the future of the continent. And this is particularly important in the COVID recovery as countries put in place measures, policies, and interventions to address the social and economic fallout of the pandemic. Today's session, is the first in the series of six webinars planned for the next two months. The session today will focus on the intersect between youth employment and transitions into a green economy. Subsequent webinars will touch on other topics, including digitization and the future of work, employment in the rural economy, youth employment in crisis and conflict, and macro policies and government actions to foster youth employment. Each webinar will be uh, anchored around an evidence synthesis paper commissioned by INCLUDE to foreground uh, the discussion on each topic. The session today will seek to answer a key question. Can the green economy provide sustainable jobs for Africans youth? In reflecting on this, we will hear about the sectors that can drive this, the challenges and opportunities, and more importantly, the role of young people. This is a very timely topic. And as you know, the world is gearing up to COP26 that will take place later this, this month, next month in November in Glasgow. And it is important to ensure that youth employment is part of these discussions and that youth voices are heard. IDRC is partnering with uh, youth organizations to amplify key messages at the COP's International Youth Day on November 5th, and the discussion today will feed into that. I look very much uh, forward to hearing from the panelists and to the discussions that follow. And without further ado, I would like to pass the virtual mic to Chamaka Mwa. Nochuku who will be moderating the session. Ch Chamaka is the coordinator of Youth Front at the African Union Office of the Youth Convoy. She's also a medical doctor by profession. Chamaka, over to you. Thank you very much, Martha, and thank you to everyone who has been um, who has joined in on this session today. Um, like Martha mentioned, my name is Chiamaka. 
electrical I'm a doctor and I previously worked um, with the African Union Office of the Youth Envoy to coordinate the Youth Front on Coronavirus as well as the Youth Charter Hustlers. Currently I serve on the Youth Advisory Panel for the Lancet Child and Adolescent Health and I work with youth engagement and inclusion in policy and governance. I've worked with Include prior um, in moderating some of the webinars earlier in the year and I'm glad to be back again to um, discuss with our very impactful panelists on today's topic on youth at work in the green economy. So before we start, I'd like to um, give some ground housekeeping rules um, so that we are all on the same page. And then afterwards, I'll be introducing the first set of panelists um, who will be making presentations today. So the first thing is that um, the webinar is being re um, recorded and parts of the recording will be used on include social media and websites. Um, so um, being part of this webinar means that most um, the web entire webinar is going to be recorded and um, part of the recording will be used. So if you would like to speak during the points where we have the Q&A sessions or you would like to make a comment, please raise your hand and then our technical support will get to you and unmute your mic so that you can speak. This is to make sure that we're all in order and we can all hear ourselves. Finally, please leave your questions in the Q&A section and comments in the chat and we will collect them and address them in the time allocated to clarification clarification questions and discussions. We don't have so many rules, just those three. Um, and I do hope that we have a very fruitful discussion. So I'd like now to introduce the first set of panelists for today. Um, and they will be discussing, um, making presentations on the various aspects of youth at work in the green economy. And we'll first of all have Dominic Glover. Um, Dominic is the author of the evidence synthesis paper on green jobs um, commissioned by INCLUDE. Um, and Dominic is a fellow of the Institute of Development Studies at the University of Sussex in the UK. He's also the co-convener of the Rural Futures Research Cluster at IDS and a member of the ESRC STEP Center. Um, Dominic for being here. We also have Robert Hill. Um, Robert is a junior research analyst at the Development Policy Research Unit and an assistant lecturer in the School of Economics at the University of Cape Town. And Dominic will be presenting a study on industries without smokestacks in South Africa. And then finally, we have Mette Lund. She will present on green economy transition policy and skills. Um, and she um, is the technical, she works as a technical officer at the Green Jobs Unit at the International Labour Organization. So these are our first set of um, speakers. And um, I'll now be handing over the virtual mic to Dominic um, to, first of all, um, give the presentation on the evidence synthesis paper. Dominic, very nice to have you here. Great. Thank you very much. Um, perhaps you could uh, give me a thumbs up, Chimaka, that you can hear me. Brilliant, thank you. And I'm now going to share my screen as well. So you could also give me a thumbs up that my screen share is working. Brilliant, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, without further ado, and uh, thank you very much for the introduction, by the way. Um, good afternoon to everybody and good morning if you're in a different time zone. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for logging in today and uh, especially to include and includes partners uh, for the invitation, first of all, to carry out the synthesis report and also to talk to you today. It's my pleasure. Um, I'm uh, Dominic Glover. I'm a fellow of the Institute of Development Studies, which is located at the University of Sussex on the south coast of England. And um, I want to emphasize today that I'm very much uh, speaking on behalf of Grace Moira, who is the lead author for this report. But unfortunately, she's not able to join us uh, today. She um, definitely deserves the bulk of the credit for this work. She led the study. She did most of the hard work of uh, finding and retrieving materials, reading an awful lot of material, making sense of it, um, analyzing it and producing the first draft of the report. And I was kind of her right hand man and uh, helping to shape the study and helping to edit the report, identify key messages, organize the material and so on. So um, unfortunately, Grace can't be here today, but I will do my best to represent the study uh, to the best of my ability. 
So our report, uh, you can see on the slide there, it's uh, entitled Green Jobs for Young People in Africa, Work in Progress, and it was actually published in um, July of this year. So the theme of the report obviously is, is youth and employment in the green economy. And as we wrote in the report, uh, the transition to a green economy constitutes a big challenge for governments and societies in Africa, as it does for governments and societies elsewhere in the world. Um, and as we said in the report, the challenge for African governments is that a green transformation of the economy will destroy and displace existing jobs, even as it creates new ones. This is bound to be disruptive, even if the eventual outcomes are generally positive. And I think this is the kind of context that we approach the, um, the study in. And since I don't have very much time today, um, and since I think uh, I'd, I'd like to say that the report does quite a good job, if I may say so, of pulling out the key uh, uh, um, knowledge gaps, the key messages and the key recommendations, I'm just going to highlight them here. One of the first things, which I guess is a rather disappointing one, is that frankly, the evidence base on green employment and youth in Africa is rather thin. We didn't find a great deal of really high quality material that would give us some really solid foundations for making firm statements about the state of play with uh, green jobs and the potential for green employment and the potential for youth employment in Africa. But the evidence that is there honestly suggests that the track record is, is mixed at best. There are maybe some good examples of some programs and initiatives, but there are also others um, that uh, maybe the, you know, the effort hasn't been sustained or the, uh, the impact has not been that widespread. And referring to the right hand of the slide, I think one of the key issues is that unsustainable activities in the, in the economy continue to offer many employment opportunities. And, and unless and until you get a momentum towards a green transformation, that's going to continue to be the case. Reverting back to the left hand of the slide, there's scant evidence that the perceptions of young people towards jobs in the green economy differ significantly from their attitudes towards employment in other economic sectors. We haven't yet reached the point where people feel that they have the freedom necessarily to make a positive choice for a job in the green economy, as opposed to some kind of legacy industry. Uh, they want jobs, they want employment, they want a decent life, um, but it's not necessarily the case that the green economy is offering the better opportunities. And again, on the right-hand slide side of the slide, I want to emphasize that in general, young women have more difficulty finding jobs than young men, especially in rural areas, but of course, it's not just about gender, there are many other intersecting um, axes of uh, social diversity and social difference, which also um, create differences in people's access to, um, to work opportunities in the green economy and elsewhere. These key messages, by the way, are summarized starting on page uh, three of the executive summary. So let me go straight into some recommendations and these are on page five of the executive summary or you can find them in section nine on page 27 of the report itself. And these are the, the key findings that I want to emphasize here. First of all, we think that if you really want to know something about the green economy and green jobs and green employment uh, and youth in the green economy, then it's important to start collecting and publishing data on green jobs and youth employment and to carry out assessments including risk analysis and mitigation. In other words, uh, we need a better evidence base if you really want to start grappling with these issues. And related to that, uh, the second point on the slide, develop theories of change to inform the design, the implementation and evaluation of youth green job strategies and interventions. Um, you need to have a clear understanding of what it is, you're, if you're trying to intervene in the system, what it is you're trying to accomplish, what is your theory of change and how are you going to tell if you're making progress in the right direction? if things are starting to shift. We've suggested that it's important to integrate youth employment and green jobs priorities into broader national economic development plans, not just treat them in isolation. And on, in a similar vein, that policies need to be coordinated at different levels. Um, going to the right-hand side of the slide, it's important to integrate gender and other axes of social difference into youth green employment programs. Something which has been emphasized, I think, throughout the study is the focus on decent employment. We're not just talking about jobs, any jobs at any cost. They need to be decent jobs. And I know that uh, some of the other speakers are going to expand on that point. It's kind of an obvious point, but we suggest that it's important to engage with stakeholders, including but not only the private sector, including but not only entrepreneurs. In particular, we need participation of youth themselves in understanding youth perspectives, youth priorities, youth obstacles, 
and uh, their views and, and, and priorities and, and listening to uh, young people um, in, in the design of interventions and, and the monitoring of those interventions. The last point on the slide is to me something which came out loud and clear from this study uh, is that there's a lot of emphasis very often on focusing on, on youth as somehow the key issue, that we need youth with better skills. But it's important, I think, also to focus on the demand side of the economy. There need to be, for example, incentives to consumers to consume uh, environmentally sustainable goods and services so that th those parts of the economy start to grow and then they will start to create job opportunities for youth and for other people. Um, there's a lot of emphasis very often as if there is some kind of problem with young people, whereas in fact the problem is, is with the economy and with the transition which all generations in society need to be a part of. One of the things we said in the report is that there are a few ways, I'm not saying no ways, but there are a few ways in which youth are in a unique or special situation compared to other generations in relation to the employment market and green jobs. And I think this leads to a bigger question. What exactly is your object of concern? Is it youth or is it something else? So youth are, yes, indeed, sometimes in a special position, but does that mean that youth is your object of concern? And does that mean that youth is your best uh, target for intervention? Now, those are two distinct questions. Let me expand on that point. So is youth your principal object of concern? Is it your best point of intervention? If a youth faces challenges accessing new technology, is it about being a youth or is it that they are poor, that they're isolated, that they're economically marginalized? If a youth can only find employment in dirty industries using legacy technologies, is that because they're youth or because they, there aren't enough good jobs in clean industries and, and new, green, uh, new um, green sectors? Likewise, if they have poor working conditions, is that about being a youth or is that they have little choice? Are they unable to quit because there aren't any other jobs or that regulation, for example, is failing to protect them in their, in their working lives? Uh, do they face discrimination? Is that specifically because of youth? Sometimes it might be, but it might also be because of gender, ethnicity, disability, sexuality, or something else. And if they can't access a loan, is it because of youth or is it because of poverty, low income, or remoteness from the suppliers of financial services? So youth, yes, they often face structural disadvantages in society. On average, I'm making generalizations here, on average, young people tend to have less control over productive assets and resources. Uh, typically, they have less life experience, less, less work experience, but these are broad generalizations. There are many exceptions. Sometimes young people might also have advantages in the economy and in the green economy. For example, perhaps their educational qualifications are better and more recent than those of their parents' generation, their grandparents' generation. Sometimes um, having less to lose can be an advantage in a certain sense if you have fewer commitments to uh, existing ways of doing things, it might be easier for you to take more risks or be more flexible, but by the same token, it makes you more vulnerable perhaps to uh, exploitation um, or to bad treatment in working conditions. But, and I want to emphasize this, of course, some youth might face these issues or might have certain situations, but they can share those characteristics with many people who are non-youth. So in the report, we said that it's important to take a, a perspective on youth that is generational, recognizing youth as a generation in themselves that faces a very particular state of the world at this stage in their lives, um, particularly with highlighted climate change, demographic transitions, the rise of digital technologies and social media, for example. We think it's important to take a relational perspective to situate youth in their relations with other generations in society and an intersectional perspective, recognizing that youth also have affinities and affiliations and connections uh, that can connect any individual youth with uh, individuals in other groups of society. And that could include gender, disability, ethnicity, geography, and so on. So going back to my previous uh, analysis, when faced with challenges in engaging new technology, it's not just youth, but anyone who encounters new technology needs skills and opportunities to engage. Any workers in sunset industries need skills and opportunities to transition to green economy. Everybody is entitled to decent working conditions, not just youth, and so on. So even if youth is your primary category of concern, does that mean that your best intervention is a youth-specific program? 
or is it a program that benefits other people, including youth? A cross cutting, is it addressing a structural obstacle? Is it addressing a functional problem? Is it addressing a cross cutting issue? So that's the end of my talk. I think uh, Chamaka is probably relieved because I may have gone a little bit over time um, and I'm looking forward to hearing what other people have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dominic. And I will stop sharing. Um, thank you very much, Dominic. Um, and um, now I'd like to hand over um, to Robert, who will be presenting on industries without smokestacks in South Africa. Robert, you have the floor. And you have 10 minutes, please. Great. Um, Thanks very much. I'm hoping that people can see my screen. Um, so essentially, uh, yeah, just to get going, I'm gonna try and be quick. Um, the paper that I'm presenting, there's an awful lot that I can say about it, um, but it's essentially a lot of work that I'm trying to condense into a very short period of time that I've done with a lot of my colleagues at the DPRU. So um, just to give you an outline of what we're going to be talking through, I'm gonna start off by giving some background and then we're going to move on to employment in the IWAS sectors, looking at some descriptive statistics, um, some labor market dynamics, employment projections. Um, we'll then also look very briefly at some firm survey case studies that we conducted and um, we'll touch briefly on COVID-19 and IWAS in South Africa. And then finally, just on some policy recommendations for how to unlock the potential of IWAS in job creation. So to begin with the background, um, between 2020 and 2050, the African youth population is expected to increase dramatically, as we heard earlier. This, will inc or this increase in population will put further pressure on African economies to generate sufficient jobs and in South Africa in particular, we've got the problem of an, a particularly high youth unemployment rate. Um, it's nearly double our aggregate unemployment rate at 59% versus 30% um, at the start of 2020. And it's approximately four times the upper middle income country youth unemployment rate. So, you know, we've got these big problems in South Africa about youth unemployment specifically. And then co the COVID-19 pandemic has also had a considerable impact on employment and the ability of economies to generate jobs. Globally, the ILO estimated that about 114 million jobs were lost in 2020, and the employment loss for the youth aged 15 to 24 was much larger than for adults at 8.7% compared to 3.7%. So the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on unemployment would intensify the need to create employment opportunities for everyone, but particularly for the youth. And in South Africa specifically, if we look historically, the manufacturing sector has generated a lot of employment. However, South Africa has been deindustrializing over the past few decades. We've seen a manufacturing share of GDP decline of 17.3% between 1980 and 2018. And um, we've seen that the biggest growth really in our, in our um, economy has been in sectors that are without smokestacks. So in finance, in transport, in wholesale and retail trade. So as I mentioned, these, these certain services-based industries, which we refer to as industries without smokestacks, they share some of the same characteristics as manufacturing, including the capacity to create better jobs. And these IWAS industries are those that are tradable, They've got high value added per worker relative to the average economy-wide productivity. So they've got um, capacity for uh, job growth. They absorb large numbers of moderately skilled labor and they demonstrate scale or agglomeration economies. And some of the examples of IWAS industries include tourism, horticulture, agro-processing and transit trade. And these sectors may then offer viable alternatives for large scale job creation in the future. So just to give you an indication of what IWAS employment looks like in South Africa, we can see if you consider this being IWAS employment and total non-IWAS employment, we can see that of the job growth that occurred between 2010 and 2018, approximately 72% of those jobs came from IWAS sectors. And IWAS was growing at a faster rate than um, non-IWAS sectors. So we can see that there is an IWAS bias in our job growth in South Africa. And in particular, if we look at the employment expansion, our top three IWAS subsectors for employment expansion are our finance sector, commercial agriculture, and horticulture. And we see that amongst them, we've got um, youth intensive IWAS sectors, our three most intensive youth um, or youth intensive IWAS sectors are trade, horticulture, and tourism. 
We can see that there's still a relatively low prevalence of youth in these sectors, but this is our um, sort of most youth intensive uh, or our most youth, youth intensive sectors um, amongst South African Iowa sectors. Looking at labor market dynamics moving forward, if we consider two different growth paths, if we were to look at South Africa in the case of um, just projecting forward our current growth path, uh, where we basically take gross value added between 2010 and 2018, and we assign that, um, that level of growth to um, Iowa sectors for the next 10 years, we'll see approximately 1 million new jobs in Iowa, which will account for about 77.4% of, to of total job growth. If on the other hand, we um, increase the growth of certain Iowa sectors. So for example, if we allowed for, um, in particular, horticulture, tourism, transit trade, and agro-processing to grow at a faster rate, so we allow in increased growth there, we can see that there would be approximately 1.4 million new jobs in Iowa, which would account for almost 82% of total job growth. The reason that we chose those four sectors is that because they were um, fairly fast growing, they were fairly youth intensive. So if you take those things in, in combination, you can um, potentially say that those sectors will grow faster. We can see that there would be a, a much larger proportion of our total job growth coming out of Iowa sectors, even if we just increased growth in those four um, Iowa sectors. Then mentioning um, something about skills that Donald mentioned, you know, one of the things that we also considered was, you know, are we going to have skill gaps? In other words, are we going to have excess labor supply um, amongst our youth if we look at the extra jobs that we get? Because one of the big problems is that people will often argue that there is a, um, a lack of youth with sufficient skills in order to take on the jobs. However, what we find is that in both scenarios, whether we're looking at our current growth trajectories or our future growth trajectories, we find that there is an excess supply of labor at every skill level. We don't find that there is any point at which we run out of youth to be able to fill um, jobs that require different skill levels, whether it be pre-secondary education or postgraduate degrees, there is an excess of youth labor um, in every single category. So it's definitely not skills that are the um, the curtailing factor in terms of job growth. Very briefly to talk about some case studies that we did. Um, as part of this research, we interviewed 18 firms that were based in the Western Cape of South Africa. Nine of these were tourism firms, and then there were three each from agro-processing, horticulture, and logistics. And we specifically asked firms in this case study about their expansion plans and their job creation plans over the next five years, as well as any skills and skill gaps amongst the youth that were employed in their main occupations. We conducted these interviews according to ONET classifications of measures of skills by level and importance. And although these results are informative, I just want to stress that they're definitely not representative of the sectors as a whole. So just to begin, the first thing to show you is that amongst all of the jobs that are created, you can see this orange bar over here shows that the majority of jobs that will be created across all of these firms come from what we term existing occupations, occupations that already existed in these firms. While there's a, a small minority of jobs that come from new occupations to these firms, it's very important, I think, to note that these occupations are not necessarily new to the world of work, but just new to those particular firms. So it's not that um, jobs in the next 10 years are, for youth are going to come that are brand new that no one's ever heard of, but potentially just from expanding um, the operations of existing firms into new occupations that they haven't had em employment in in the past. Then if you look at um, skills deficits, we measure a whole bunch of skills according to ONET um, measures, and we calculated skills aggregate skill deficits um, for, these, for these different skills. We call them hard and soft skills, which com um, they comprise basic skills, social skills, problem solving skills, et cetera. And um, with a skill deficit level of one, meaning that there's no deficit and a skill level um, or a, a measure of five indicating that there's a high deficit, we can actually see that amongst these Iowa sectors, apart from in horticulture, where there is a particularly large demand for scientific um, research-based um, occupations, we see that the skill deficits are actually very, very low um, in our Iowa sectors. And we see that there's actually very little evidence to suggest that there are major skill deficits amongst youth in Iowa sectors. 
Then just very briefly to talk about how COVID-19 has impacted this, because our, our, our analysis was before the COVID-19 pandemic, we can see that IWAS was definitely more robust to employment loss during the pandemic, with only a 6.8% decline in the um, first to second quarter of last year, or a 4.3 decline in employment across the whole of last year, compared to 12.7 and 9.2% declines in employment across the other um, non-IWAS sectors. However, we do see that youth employment shares were severely impacted across our four sectors of interest. Youth employment was particularly hard hit, and um, we see that youth employment is particularly precarious and vulnerable because they've lost um, a lot of employment uh, during the pandemic. So very, very quickly right at the end here um, to try and conclude, we were looking at all of this and we came to the conclusion that when you're looking at policies to try and promote youth employment in the future, there's really no one size fits all policy. Any policy that unlocks Iowa's potential needs to be very specific and tailored. Although there are some certain um, overarching policy interventions which arise, such as investment in infrastructure and increasing accountability for government. There are skill policies that could be implemented to increase um, skill attainment, but we, we don't think that these are necessarily the, the crux of what needs to happen. Um, and what we also discovered is that there was very little um, impact of COVID-19 on the types of policies that we find um, we should be implementing. So just very, very much in conclusion, in conclusion South Africa was already on an IWAS-based growth trajectory. Um, our results suggested that tourism and horticulture have potential to be our largest job generators. Our policy response must be tailored at a detailed subsectoral level. And all of our results that we found, we find that the policy does not get impacted by COVID-19. However, um, the youth have borne the brunt of the pandemic loss, which means it's important to ensure youth employment isn't precarious moving forward for other economic shocks. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And I, I saw you rushing to be able to meet time and you did. Well done. Thank you very much. Um, I'd now ask, um, I would now like to pass the mic on to Mete. Um, and um, she will be talking um, about the green economy transition and policies, um, green economy transition policies and skills. And she's representing ILO. Um, you have the floor, Mete. Um, thank you so much, uh, Chiamaka. Uh, do you see my screen like the big slide now or my, the one with my notes? All right, cool. Thanks. I see both with your ah, notes. See, I thought so. Yeah, I have to change it then so you don't get confused or notice if I say anything wrong. Let me see if this, does this work now? Or do you still see both? Yes. This, this works. Works now. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks for the help. And I'll also set a small timer just to make sure I don't uh, overstuff my time. All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Meta. Thank you so much for the introduction. And uh, thank you to Dominic and Robert for both uh, your presentations. I think um, they support really well the, the sort of purpose of, of today's um, meeting, which is really highlighting the need of basing policy work on, on evidence now. And I think, um, Dominic, you mentioned uh, how there is a lack of knowledge when we talk about uh, green jobs in general, but especially so for, for youth. No? And that's um, something that we work a lot with here in the ILO. We promote a statistical definition of green jobs as well, which uh, helps government uh, measure the the, the impact of their policies on, on green jobs. And they do that, for example, in, in Nigeria, which allows government to, based on evidence, uh, uh, understand how environmental policies will impact uh, employment um, and vice versa. And I think that's that's really important and, and needed. Um, so um, my name is Meta. I come from the ILO. And real quick, uh, the ILO is the UN uh, specialized agency for everything related to the world of work. Um, compared to the other UN agencies, the ILO is tripartite. It means that our constituents are both uh, governments, employers, organizations, and labor unions. Um, so in that sense, it's, uh, in my opinion, a really cool democratic uh, organization uh, representing the world of work. Um, 
And um, today I'll talk a little bit about how we can, uh, now we just heard about uh, various research on, on the challenges that youth face in terms of employment. Um, I'll talk a little bit about how climate change affects uh, youth and uh, employment more broadly, but how climate uh, action can also be a driver for job creation. And then I'll talk about the policy framework, which the ILO is using based on, on, on the linking climate action to uh, social development. So for example, decent job creation. Um, this framework is called a just transition. And I'll explain a bit more about that uh, throughout. Um, great. To start with, um, I won't spend too much time about this, but as we have already heard and all know, uh, even prior to COVID-19, young people faced major uh, labor market challenges. And this overview just shows how uh, those challenges are even uh, worse and more dire in middle income countries and then uh, even more so in developing countries. So, um, what we also know is that uh, climate change is a major driver of change in the labor market. So women uh, and men, and particularly uh, young women and men, they are uh, more vulnerable to those impacts on the labor market. So um, of the majority of 1.2 billion young people in the world, uh, they are uh, living in countries that are highly dependent on natural resources. So. Uh, Africa as a continent and, and region is a, a, a great example of this, where uh, the vulnerability of youth employment uh, is closely linked to the use of and, and um, dependency on, on natural resources in uh, industries such as agriculture, forestry, and, and fishery. So um, therefore we can see that climate change, uh, no climate action, and most importantly, climate inaction is really closely linked uh, to the employment prospects uh, for the world's uh, young people. Um, so how does climate change uh, and how does climate action impact job prospects? So, um, let, oh, uh, yeah. So uh, this is an example of uh, an energy transition. So uh, what we can see, and Dominic mentioned this, uh, from climate action, we see an overall positive uh, distribution and, and impact on employment. Um, in this scenario, we see that uh, 25 million do jobs will be, uh, that's the full job uh, potential. So we have uh, a total of 25, new, uh, 25 million new jobs created, but 7 million jobs will be lost. Um, the majority of those, you can see the 5 million, they can be relocated. Um, but there are some jobs that will be de destroyed. Um, and if workers are not reskilled or in other ways transferred into new employment, then they will uh, be um, unemployed. Um, and uh, that's basically what we're trying to advocate for with the Just Transition, making sure that we uh, plan ahead for this transition, which has to happen. We do have to uh, move along towards uh, green and uh, more sustainable uh, ways of living our life. And that has to be planned for so that we don't lose these people. Um, uh, that will be negatively impacted um, from, from such a transition. Um, still, what we see, and um, I believe that uh, we already touched upon this uh, previously, but um, the recovery packages, for example, that are being rolled out uh, now due to COVID, they are not typically green. So something that we also promote is exactly through policy and investment to make sure that you invest in green uh, industries and green jobs um, in order to promote and sort of um, benefit from, from those employment gains. Um, yeah, shortly about a just transition. The just transition is um, and a concept that was originally st uh, started by the labor union, but since 2015, uh, we got the ILO Just Transition Guidelines. 
and they were adopted by by governments and workers and employers so in that sense it's now a whole of society and a holistic approach um so on my next slide i'll show you sort of how what i mean when i say it's holistic so uh dominic mentioned that uh, green youth employment cannot be addressed in silos right and and this is i completely support that message because um a just transition is looking at nine policy areas and i tried to split them up here for you so that you can sort of see how they're grouped um and what is really important is that when you think about youth employment um and a just transition and environmental and ecological transition that is socially just that it doesn't leave anyone behind then you have to address the challenge from all of these areas so for example youth employment cannot just be an issue for the labor ministry it has to be integrated with education and agriculture and um, investments and enterprise development, etc. So uh, I wanted to highlight three policy areas. Um, one's, uh, one is skills and reskilling. The other one is on enterprise development and entrepreneurship, which is sort of the demand side, uh, which uh, Dominic mentioned as well. And then the last one is social protection, which uh, might be a little bit of a surprise for you. Um, yeah, here we go. <laughs> First, uh, skilling and reskilling. Um, so the job potential that I was talking about, these 20 million jobs that can be created uh, as new additional jobs, in order to actually reap that potential, we have to invest in skills. And um, as uh, was mentioned previously, it's not necessarily that the skills that young people have today is the wrong. We just make, need to bridge that skills gap that has been created. And um, the, the, um, the sort of figure on the left shows you um, these nationally determined contributions, which are sort of the environmental plans that governments set to reach the Paris Agreement. Uh, they very rarely address uh, uh, skills and skills development. So uh, that's, of course, a huge challenge in terms of thinking the holistic approach to climate change. The other side is uh, an example of how uh, the skills uh, need a demand from a greener, and in this case, from an energy sustainability scenario will look like. And in the middle, you have a mix of both um, soft skills and hard skills, which is a great thing. And that's why there are so many jobs that are transferable, because you will uh, have easily transferable uh, soft skills that can be used in in these new green um, industries. Last, uh, I want to uh, know the second point I wanted to show was enterprise development. And this is really addressing this um, demand side, the basically creation of jobs. No? So that's why enterprise development is so hugely important in terms of making sure that new jobs are, uh, are created. Um, one example could be, uh, for example, entrepreneurship training. No? And oh, I'm already out of time, so I won't cover the last point, but just this one. Um, what we see is that um, uh, entrep entrepreneurship is obviously one uh, great way to link uh, enterprise development and uh, job creation for youth. Um, so you can do it in, in many ways, of course, but when we look at, at green entrepreneurship, you can think about green and social businesses that are green at the core. And then you have the other uh, aspect, which is greening uh, existing businesses or greening the process. So I brought with me two examples, uh, Richie from Tanzania, who made this uh, really cool um, soil, uh, um, soil alternative. So he's combating soil erosion. And um, it turns out that these uh, cocoa peat, who are, which is, um, organic and, and uh, completely natural, it is a great uh, incubator soil for flowers. So in that way, he managed to uh, solve uh, an environmental problem, soil erosion, uh, with uh, a green uh, business. The same goes for Kutsai from, from Zimbabwe. She, uh, she was making um, a locally produced alternative to cornstarch. So she uh, is uh, promote, uh, developed this product, which is a green banana flower that is um, 
a cheap nutrition source, uh, source for undernourished children and is locally produced. So it can create uh, jobs through the production, um, local production as well, um, which is a, a great example uh, of how there are uh, spillover effects of, of uh, enterprise development and entrepreneurship. So not only are uh, Rich and Kutsai employing people in their own business, but they are obviously also creating uh, local demand for, for their uh, resources that they need for their production. So I'll stop now. Uh, I'll be happy to mention uh, something further on social protection later on, but I want to respect time. So I'll, I'll stop sharing here. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Mate, and thank you to everyone who has presented, um, and thank you for um, keeping to time. <laughs> so um, we're going to take um, questions. I can already see some questions in the chat. I know um, some of them have been answered, but for the benefit of everyone who is listening, I'm going to read out the questions. They're just clarifying questions on the um, papers and documents that have been presented so that we get a better idea. Um, so the first question is for Robert. And the question is, are I was um, automatically green just because they don't have smokestacks? Tourism, for example, can pose environmental challenges. Um, and then there's a second question for Robert. So you can just ask them, ask, answer everything. Um, at, at the same time. So um, someone asked, Garrett asked, can you give an exact definition of IWAS? So Robert, if you can answer those two questions, that'd be great, thanks. Sure, so I think uh, the first thing to mention is that, and as it's been pointed out in the chat as well, the definition that we used for IWAS is a little bit airy-fairy. Um, it, it's It doesn't quite uh, pin anything down. Um, you know, it, it's what I mentioned in the presentation about IWAS sectors, you know, they, they are these things that are tradable, they've got high value added per worker, they absorb large num numbers of moderately skilled labor, and um, demonstrate scale or agglomeration economies. Now, unfortunately, that's a very, uh, it's a nebulous kind of concept, it, it'll depend what it is, you know, they'll change year on year, potentially, because these aren't um, fast requirements. But the, the idea was here that um, amongst the sectors that created those kinds of, um, or that, that fulfilled those conditions, we were part of a multi-country study that analyzed IWAS. And so we standardized across a number of countries as to what we were looking at. So particularly looking at things that were related to agriculture, um, we had finance and business in there, we had tourism and we had trade. Um, so we had about eight sectors, I believe. Um, I can't remember exactly what all of them are, but they are they are somewhere in my slides. I can look them up. But to answer the question about whether they are necessarily green, the answer to that is no. Um, Iowa sectors are not automatically green just by virtue of the fact that they don't have a smokestack. I think what we can do is we can potentially argue that they are slightly more green because they don't have um, smokestacks. You know, we could argue that rather than having factories um, involved in heavy manufacturing, we've got a more services-based economy. So maybe there's a slightly more green focus on, um, these, on these sectors, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are directly green. And I think one of the really key things is to be able to navigate a space where we both develop jobs in IWAS, which seems to be the way that the, the world is moving, as well as prioritizing green jobs within those sectors. So looking within Iowa sectors, which are high youth employment um, potential and saying, all right, well, we know that this is where jobs are going to grow. How can we then take those jobs and make them green? All right, thank you very much, Robert. Um, and then I have a question here for Mete. And then the question is, I was interested to see the slide quantifying the relative spending of various governments on COVID-19 recovery, including the proportion devoted to green recovery. Um, the figure for the USA was very small. I guess this does not include Joe Biden's multi-trillion dollar infrastructure program. Um, thank you for the interesting presentation. 
Uh, thanks for the the question, uh, Dominic. <laughs> um, I, I I realized, and I guess that you would find uh, some of those things interesting. Uh, that's true. Then, even though the calculations are from UNEP from uh, twenty twenty one, the numbers themselves uh, are from twenty nineteen. So they're uh, they're the initial recovery spendings. Um, and even though uh, the US will be probably uh, moving up the ranks, um, we still see that percentage wise, um, the, the focus on, on, on green investment is not as high as it could be in these COVID uh, response packages. Um, now that you uh, gave me the word, Chiamaka, I want to add something to Robert's excellent answer, because I think what he is touching upon is very important. So when you talk about green jobs, you can have green jo jobs that are green at the core. So that could be, for example, um, well, uh, jobs that work in renewable energy or in agriculture. But there's also a very important component, which is greening with jobs. So as we see young people entering the labor market with more green skills, we will also see a shift in the jobs and the, the industries that are not traditionally green. On top of that, um, you know, these uh, new and very um, labor intensive industries, um, for example, as the iOS, they can be um, drivers for that. So I think what is, is really important is to think about, um, and that's also what this, for example, the ILO work, uh, where we try to measure the, the employment impacts of, of um, environmental policy. Don't just look at where you have the biggest sort of environmental impact, also look at where there are, is a great intersect in terms of employment gains. So for example, renewable energy, that has a huge uh, environmental impact, but a very small uh, employment impact there because there's only a small uh, employment gain when, when you are um, building the renewable energy sources, but there's little maintenance compared to, for example, uh, environment uh, or energy efficiency. That is a much bigger uh, employment gain and still a pretty good environmental gain as well. So what we're just uh, trying to promote is that you look at those things together so that you don't uh, address um, uh, social challenges and environmental challenges uh, independently. Um, so that was just a short comment for, for Robert's uh, otherwise uh, excellent answer and also great question, I think. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, yes, perfect. I think yeah. I think my internet um, became wonky for a little bit. So thank you, Mete, and thank you for adding to Robert's answer on this. Um, I have a question for Dominic um, because um, I had a question since, and I don't think I see any question for him in the chat. So you posed the question during your presentation, and um, I think it was something for us to think about, but I'd also like to hear what your thoughts on it are. So do we have youth-specific policies? Um, if, if you're going to look at the um, synthesis paper that was created, do you think, what would be your recommendation, youth-specific policies or cross-cutting policies that also benefit youth? And I'm going to refer to Meta's presentation to elaborate on that question. So she mentioned something about reskilling and upskilling, and this is important in every sector, but I think when you mentioned it, you mentioned it as something being specific to the young workers in those um, sectors. But I'd like to know um, from the research that has been done on green economies, do we think that it is something that we should look at general reskilling, upskilling, and advocacy for um, greener jobs in general, as opposed to directly targeting it as something that needs to be done specifically for young people? So, um, yeah, Dominic, that's my question to you. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I think it's a rather a uh, large question and an important one. I think um, the first thing I'd say is I, I totally agree with what's just recently been said about um, the, uh, the need to focus on the type of job within a sector. I don't think you can generalize across a sector. Um, and uh, but I also think there's a, there's a comment in the chat box uh, from Stephen Hunt, which uh, points out that actually 
you know, the, the concept of, of what constitutes a green job is kind of a problematic, it's a difficult one to kind of think about conceptually, and then it's difficult to quantify that. Okay, so leaving those qualifications aside, uh, to address your question, uh, Chamaka, I mean, I think that the, imagine that we are uh, entering into a grand transformation of economies in Africa and elsewhere to be uh, 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 green economies, to be more sustainable economies, but which also are creating good and decent jobs and sufficient employment for people who, who need employment. Um, then I think, yes, certainly, uh, skilling, reskilling, upskilling, um, uh, uh, assisting people to acquire new skills and transition into new kinds of work uh, is definitely required. And I think that applies to people at all, at all ages. Um, I think the reason why there's a strong justification for having youth and young people as an important object of concern. Uh, and that's because there are a lot of youth worldwide, there are a lot of youth in Africa, and also because the young people, today's youth generation and today's children and people about to be born are going to have to uh, cope with the problems of climate change and um, global environmental change much longer than the rest of us. And so I think, you know, that creates a an important responsibility on humanity to be concerned about that large generation which has got a big challenge to face. Um, but reskilling and transitioning from, from old dirty industries into new cleaner industries and also all of the things that go with that, new patterns of consumption, new patterns of behavior, new, new ways of working for all of us, uh, new ways of mobility, new ways of of uh, recreation, um, all kinds of things are going to have to change. It's, it, it's going to involve uh, root and branch changes of behavior and actually in my work one of the things that I focus on is is technological change in general and a neglected aspect of uh, understanding what goes on in technological change is how you abandon uh, existing practices existing habits existing um, behaviors and transition to new ways of doing things and sometimes letting go of those established ways is is one of the bigger challenges and in that respect I do think that there's a reason for thinking of youth as being having a special characteristic, not because youth are intrinsically more innovative or more creative or more friendly to new technology, but simply because they don't necessarily have the ingrained habits that the rest of us have acquired. Uh, they are potentially more open to new ways of doing things simply because they haven't already been uh, kind of uh, habituated into the existing current ways of doing things. So let me stop speaking and let somebody else have a go. Thank you, Dominic, and, and thank you for answering that question. And, and um, thank you to all our speakers. Um, we're going to have a short round of discussions again at the end of the session. But now I'd like to invite um, two more panelists, and they will be talking more about the work that they are doing with their organization. So I have Bart. First of all, Bart works with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the Netherlands. He's a policy officer for innovation. And and at the Sustainable Economic Development Department, he manages programs that support the development of innovative startups and um, MSMEs. So thank you, Bart, for being here. And then I also have Joshua. Um, Joshua is an environmentalist and climate activist who focuses on the role of youth in climate change, adaptation, disaster risk reduction, and resilience building. Um, I think Joshua is from Ghana. Very nice to meet you. Um, so I'll, I'll be handing the virtual mic now to Bart, first of all, who will be talking about the work that um, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs is doing. Um, and he will speak for 10 minutes. And then afterwards, Joshua would have the floor to discuss the work that he's doing um, with his activism and advocacy. So um, Bart, you have the floor now. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, good to be here with you. And thank you for the invite for this. Uh, very interesting session. I've been listening with uh, great enthusiasm to the, uh, the last couple of speakers. Um, so first of all, I'll just uh, tell a little bit more about uh, what the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs does on this team. Uh, so we approach the green economy from uh, different perspectives, not only from the perspective of climate and biodiversity, but also very importantly, from the perspective of uh, micro, small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, so we believe that uh, MSMEs, 
uh, are the, the main engine uh, of growth uh, and economic development and employment. And our aim is to really strengthen these enterprises and the enabling environment they operate in. Uh, so within this category, we give particular attention to uh, young people and women. Uh, and there's a lot of things that we know and, about, and a lot of things that we don't know about the position of uh, young people uh, from an MSME perspective in a green economy. Um, we believe that it's uh, the transition to a green economy uh, is potentially a very powerful paradigm to a sustainable economic development in low and middle income countries. Um, there's plenty of examples that it can be a solution uh, towards uh, environmental prob problems such as plastic pollution, uh, erosion, uh, CO2 emissions, but it can also be an opportunity to uh, improve working conditions, uh, especially in the informal economy. Um, so there are examples so far on quite a small scale, uh, to, my, to my perspective, uh, that indicate that the Korean economy can create new jobs. Uh, and also in line with the evidence paper, uh, we see that still uh, the evidence is still quite thin. Um, so questions that we are still struggling with uh, range from what, the, what you, uh, to what extent do green business models offer an attractive alternative to uh, for young people in comparison to business models in the, uh, the linear economy? Uh, what skills do young people need exactly uh, to work in the green economy? And what exactly is the definition of this, uh, this category? And what are the different subsectors within this economy? Uh, and what policies, policies do we need to accelerate uh, a just and an inclusive transition to, uh, to the green economy? So these are some of the things that we're dealing with at the ministry. Um, we believe that we need to build up more evidence to really industry the uh, the positive effects of the green economy for private sector development, uh, employment, and economic growth in line with sustainable development rule eight. Um, and currently, our focus when it comes to this theme is really about uh, learning, experimenting, uh, testing new approaches uh, with the green economy as a cross-cutting theme uh, in our private sector development uh, work. Uh, so, how do we do this in practice? I'll just share uh, one example uh, of how we uh, try to stimulate this. Um, we support the development of new green business models uh, through incubation programs, for example, uh, but also feasibility studies uh, and prototype development. Uh, one example that we, we funded through our innovation fund, which is quite a recent uh, uh, accomplishment also, is um, the development of the business model of Serious Business, which is a social enterprise uh, that's based in the Netherlands. Um, so this project of Serious Business called uh, the MOSA project uh, was aimed at uh, collecting and processing single-use plastics in Morocco. Um, Serious Business has conducted a feasibility studies, study from, with our uh, uh, financing, and they introduced a deposit system for the collection and recycling of plastic bottles in Moroccan supermarkets. Um, so they were actually uh, presenting the results of their feasibility studies uh, uh, two weeks ago, uh, and there they showed us that uh, they were able to turn this, 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 this green, this circular, uh, idea, that's what it started with, into a revenue model. Uh, and they were able actually not only to make it a, a business model, but also really provide employment opportunities to a lot of informal workers that really depend on collecting uh, waste as a day-to-day -day wage. Um, and they were also successful to cooperate with two of the largest supermarket chains in Morocco uh, called Marjan and Carrefour. Uh, and now that the feasibility studies has recently been completed, uh, they're exploring uh, new options to scale up uh, towards different supermarket chains, but also to uh, other countries in the region. So this really gives us hope that uh, by stimulating innovations, we can really find the things that work and that don't work uh, to further explore what this, this green economy and especially employment of uh, young people uh, can really mean in practice. Um, so uh, through learning and experimentation, uh, we are aiming to build up an evidence base uh, we want to do that more on a structural basis. So in our department, we have a, uh, uh, for private sector development, we have a new theory of change uh, and also a strategic learning agenda. We really try to uh, be more structured when it comes to learning about uh, the opportunities of the new economy. Uh, and based on what we learn, we can really apply the positive outcomes um, to other programs and activities as well within our private sector development work. Um, so this way we can show that there's a business case for green and circular principles, uh, but also decent work uh, for young people. Um, we believe uh, that there is a need uh, for fighting, for finding the, the right balance between uh, our ambitions on the one hand for creating jobs and creating opportunities for young people, 
uh, and transitioning to a green economy. Um, and in the perfect scenario, we, we, we hope to create sufficient number of decent and green jobs for young people, of course. But uh, also one thing that I'd like to add uh, that could be interesting for the discussion is that we don't want to um, uh, strive for perfection. Uh, there's a risk that if we strive for perfection, uh, that the green transition will only uh, constrain the uh, possibilities for youth employment in developing countries. And instead of that, we want to see uh, that the green economy functions as, a, uh, as an accelerator uh, of employment uh, and growth opportunities. So at this stage, we really try to uh, give enough space to experiments and also probably uh, by doing this uh, fail to do things right, some innovation will not work. Uh, that's the thing within, with innovation in practice as well. Um, but through this process, we think that we can get a better idea of what does work and what does not work. Um, so that brings me to the question of the panel that, uh, that could be interesting to uh, go into after. Uh, is from your perspective, how can we really ensure that uh, transition to a green economy can be an accelerator of employment and growth as opposed to being a uh, constrainer of opportunities for young people? Uh, so thanks. Uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the uh, discussion. And now back to you. Thank you very much, Bart, for your presentation. And it's interesting to hear um, some of the work the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is doing um, in supporting um, green businesses and business models. I think in the chat, someone asked if you could share a, a link to the moral core case study. If you have that, please, you can just share in the chat box. I'll now hand over to Joshua um, from Youth Climate Lab. Um, Joshua, you have the floor now. Hi, everyone. Um, and Chiamaka, just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me, just to be sure that I'm, I'm audible. Perfect. Uh, thanks, everyone, and really great conversation. Uh, very happy to hear the sort of thoughts from the earlier panel and all the research that is going on. Uh, my name is Joshua. Um, I'm sort of a general climate activist working with a lot of young people um, globally and also in Africa, um, and also engaged with the Youth Climate Lab on a couple of research that is currently ongoing. I think to jump straight into the conversation today around green jobs and youth, um, so looking at Africa, um, there are a few things I want to highlight, uh, which um, would also re-emphasize some of the points that have been made earlier. I think one in general, seeing that sort of young people need jobs and that is a priority, is just a job, you know, just, just, just get a job and have and have income and that is that is a priority uh, while that is the case um, and a lot of people wouldn't necessarily have so much um, so much time to sort of see see even filter through different options they have because options are pretty limited in this case we are seeing increasingly compared to earlier say from somewhere uh, 2015 till now uh, and comparing that to before that young people who have sort of a professional background to the green sector want to stick to their field of study compared to before where they would ideally end up leaving school and want to work anywhere that they will get to stick to their profession uh, and find an opportunity within that profession um, at the same time of course the time is an important factor here uh, and how resilient young people can be in terms of waiting and exploring these options uh, and I think, um, particularly for Sub-Saharan Africa, this has also led to a lot of um, enter enterprise development uh, for people in such uh, status where they have the background to a green sector, they want to stick to that background, there's not enough opportunity there, so they end up creating something for themselves. Um, how sustainable that is, that is a question that we need to look into, uh, but generally what my organization and sort of the network I'm part of now is doing a development available for young people who want to pursue this. And this include both soft skills and hard skills. Um, so an example would be uh, taking young people uh, uh, who have either the hard skills of say operating a small recycling company or operating a small waste collection enterprise or a solar sort of micro solar enterprise selling in rural villages and providing them with soft skills like marketing, communication, 
that enhances the viability of the enterprise and make sure that the enterprise can actually uh, thrive beyond just having the product in hand and wanting to sell it. Uh, and at the same time, also talking to some of the colleagues uh, who have come from university, who have the soft skills, they know how to communicate, they know how to put things on paper and linking them to enterprises who have the product in hand, who might have the hard skills, but really lack the soft skills to thrive and sort of doing this much to ensure that sort of there is cohesion and sort of working together, matching the different skill sets uh, to, to enhance um, the, the viability of enterprises. In general, we've seen that for the green sector in general and sort of green jobs availability, there is high potential amongst MSMEs. Uh, and here I would agree with Bart that uh, most of the opportunities we've seen are not with sort of bigger companies and even corporations, but really with micro and small medium enterprises locally uh, who have a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of energy, uh, who understand local context pretty much uh, and easily detect the opportunity of either sort of um, leveraging on the circular economy approach um, to sort of um, convert their waste material, or typically defined waste material into a useful product and using that to sort of engage other young people uh, through jobs um, and other things. The challenge there, uh, which is something that we saw particularly during the time of COVID. And a good example would be uh, in Gaia, which I'm also affiliated to, which was implementing sort of a local, local led or community based circular economy model for waste management. And a, a large fraction of the engagement on this model relies on informal waste workers uh, who are not contracted, they don't have a contract per se. Uh, they do not have any documentation guiding the work that they do. Uh, and during COVID, well, it played a very significant role in terms of waste collection, bringing it to start and allowing the MSME to act, and they do not have a fixed salary, and you have such a disturbance in the economy, they were really at a very high risk. And there was no way they could earn money they do not have any contract, any safe. That sort of opens up a very broader question of why we do sort of this transition to green economy and sort of provide access and support to MSMEs that are working within the green sector. It is very important to make sure that this transition is just, in, is just and provide space for the informal sector to thrive alongside building a lot of training to their former counterparts, uh, in this case, on how they can engage with the informal sector, uh, but also sort of providing capacity for the informal sector uh, for them to thrive. And it was during the COVID time and a lot of funding or finance were available for sort of COVID recovery for informal waste workers, or waste collectors, or waste pickers. But all of these funds were channeled through MSMEs and not directly to these informal workers because they are not well organized and so to say uh, and sort of how do we move them past this point where they are organized and they can hold resources themselves and be sort of responsible for for that so these are some of the things that we've seen and and particularly for for young people i think it's really a question of sort of how do we create a balance between having increasing the accessibility to green jobs, but also making sure that it is sustainable in the long term and not a job that you get for one year or two years. And then it's sort of a, the, the, the opportunity is not there anymore. The, the sort of green jobs do not thrive. And that is how do we make sure that these opportunities that are coming up from green jobs thrive? How do we make sure that the just transition includes and cater for the informal sector the informal economy, so that they are well included and their safety and security is also taken into consideration. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joshua. Um, thank you um, for, for your remarks and for talking about the work that you have been doing with advocacy um, in the transition to green jobs, especially for small to medium enterprises. So um, I think um, Bart already shared the link 
to the Moroccan case study in the in the chat box. And you can leave any questions you have for any of the panelists in the chat box. But I do have one question for Bart and one question for Joshua while I um, and then any other questions that come up, I will just ask them. So the first question um, I have is for Bart. And then, you know, you mentioned a lot of interesting case studies. Well, you mentioned one major interesting case study um, and how the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is supporting um, innovative ideas like such that you mentioned, right? And I would just like to know in your experience and from the work that you have done, what do you think are the major challenges facing these solutions from scale? Because, you know, in presentations like this, there's always a discussion about, oh, this is the new innovative thing that this young person is doing. We just hear about it as something that is supported in the development world. We never, not many of them eventually make it to large scale solutions that are being adopted all over the world. So I would want to know what you think are the major barriers as a stand to um, these innovative solutions for um, the transition to greener jobs um, or, or, or greener solutions um, to the currently existing jobs? Very good question. It's uh, sometimes when, I, when I'm at work, these are the kind of questions that I hope that I have the answer to. And then we have the golden formula for uh, for scaling up these, these green enterprises. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, um, the biggest issues that that we see from our experience, uh, and we also try to to uh, to give follow up on this in our programs. Uh, of course, this is something you always hear. Finance uh, skills has been mentioned already, uh, and access to markets. Uh, and in our programs, we also focus mainly uh, on this finance part. And I'm not talking only about uh, the, uh, the 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 most the, the really the beginning of of, of when a, a company uh, start starts really a little bit later uh, in the phase, in the, the, the comp competitive phase when an enterprise uh, has proven to, um, to have developed a business model. Uh, but then we see that it's very difficult, especially for, for green and circular business models, um, to make the leap from, okay, we're an enterprise of about uh, 30 to 50 people. Uh, how do you scale that further uh, within a country uh, or also on a much larger scale? Um, so this is um, this is this is the main thing. I think finance and also um, one way that we try to tackle this is through uh, a fund called the Orange Corners Innovation Fund. Uh, the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs is the Orange Corners program where we try to uh, uh, to incubate um, innovative business models uh, from local MSMEs, um, and then we added the Orange Corners Innovation Fund as a way to uh, as an add-on to this uh, this incubation program. Uh, so after these enterprises have gone through a couple of years of, uh, of incubating and growing an enterprise, uh, after that, we try to give them uh, the opportunity to, uh, uh, to further grow uh, using finance, uh, finance solutions. And the second thing that I'd like to highlight is um, that it's very useful for, a, uh, for an innovation to find cooperation with existing businesses. Uh, and this is also something that, that's quite challenging because... Um, it was already mentioned in the presentation before, greening existing businesses. It's still quite uh, a challenge for an existing business to, uh, this is quite a generalization, so it doesn't go hold up in, in, in all cases, um, but find the cooperation between uh, a green innovation and an existing um, larger business uh, that still did not find the switch towards a green transition. Um, this innovation can really stimulate uh, existing businesses to uh, to, to also contribute to the green transition, but this is still quite a uh, challenge in practice, I think. So these are the, the main uh, things from my perspective. Thank you. And um, you made a very important point, um, um, greening existing businesses, because um, I think uh, something that I, I was hoping to also, um, that you also highlight in your comments where, yes, we do know that finances are a problem, but more like why are the people with money not investing in greener business models or in scaling innovative solutions. So a point you made about the fact that there are already existing large structures and large corporations with existing models, a good way to also look at um, making this transition would be saying, how do we do the existing 
things or carry out the existing processes in a way that is better and um, um, makes us transition better into a greener economy. So thank you very much for that response, Bart. And then for my question to Joshua, um, yes, Dominic highlighted something important which you brought up, which is which I think was very is very important to this conversation, and it is the informality in the employment sector and how in Africa the informal sector forms a very large part of our workforce, and it is something that we do have to live with. Um, you mentioned that there's a high potential amongst medium to small um, enterprises. And I want to know in your, um, in your experience and with working with MSMEs, we see a lot of MSMEs um, doing work in different areas, good work, but um, like what I mentioned to Bart, work that hasn't been replicable across board. So how do we collate all of that energy, all of that innovation into actually um, into something that is is um, able to turn the tides, if if I may if I may put it that way. How do we collaborate all the efforts, all over the place, into something that is collaborative, is groundbreaking, and can change the existing structures that we currently have? Uh, thanks very thanks very much, Yamaka, for that for bringing in that question for us to look at it from a different perspective. My first um, my first response to this would be that. A lot of the work that the informal sector uh, is doing, and I mean, they contribute to, I think, roughly around 80% of Africa's labor force, and I mean, about 55% of the GDP of the, of the continent in all sub-Saharan Africa. And a large fraction of this work that is doing and the innovation that goes on within the sector goes undocumented. And, and I think it starts from there. It really starts from documentation, and, and that documentation needs to be done by the sector itself and that will mean and that is where the soft skills training comes in or at least matching up those with the hard skills with those on the continent who have the soft skills i mean i, I do not believe in documentation when someone external to a sector comes in to do the documentation because typically what happens is that you you document it from a very external perspective uh, and it's, it's much better in terms of replication when you really insight the sector when you're really part of the sector itself and you're active within that sector to do such a documentation to allow for replication to allow for review and evaluation uh, and to allow for improvement and that is not something that exists at the moment so i think a good way to start that will be a lot of investment that comes towards the sector should really not always go to sort of the well-established entities who have all this sort of the paperwork and the and the formalities all sorted out, but really should go into upscaling the informal sector and at least formalize them to a certain extent, which is all the work that we are doing, particularly within waste management, that we put in individual waste pickers together, working together with municipalities in Accra in Tanzania, uh, in Ghana in Tanzania, also some parts of, um, of Zambia, really making sure that we sort of formalize in the informal sector to a certain extent where they can do such documentation and allow for sort of research to come in, for the science to come in, to sort of for, for, for broader co corporates and people who have these, like you said, who have really well-documented structures to come in and evaluate and offer improvement. But if the baseline documentation is not there, it's really, really difficult to offer advice and to offer improvement to the informal sector. So we, we should advocate for larger investment directly into the informal sector and upscaling them. Uh, particularly on soft skills, uh, said that they are able to offer sort of site documentation at the level and allowing development agencies, development actors, corporates and researchers to come in to support that process. The other part, which I think um, is also important uh, for us to mention in terms of how do we bring this together, uh, is also really sort of the advocating for development agencies and government to not necessarily see the informal uh, sector as a beneficiary to an intervention. Because I mean, if you have a sector that contributes, I mean, 55% to a GDP and sort of have 80% labor force, you have to work with them and you really need to work with them very closely and have them as a very close ally. But because there's just little data on the informal sector in the first place, it's, of course, it's very difficult for, for even government and we work with municipalities a lot and it's very difficult for them to even plan an intervention. So the best bet is to work with a research institute or a, or a formal entity that could 
sort of provide some assumptions and some extrapolations for, for this to happen. But if interventions are going to work, we need to invest in data, data for the informal sector and have it as close to, to precise as possible to make sure that interventions are, are positive and are effective. So this will be my sort of uh, on top of my head, some of the actions that could be done uh, to help us uh, sort of uh, better bring the, the informal sector towards the point where they are part of this just transition and not left behind. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Joshua. That is a very um, comprehensive answer. And I like the point you made about documentation and working with um, those in the informal sector. So I see Dominic's hand is up um, and I know you want to say a few words. Yes, please go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to briefly jump in. I, I really was fascinated listening to Joshua and I, it, I, I think it's important just to uh, to take note of the fact, as, as Joshua was speaking, that when you're dealing with informal organisations, that uh, working with those organisations and building their capacity is actually what skill, upskilling looks like. And um, important to that is to recognise that skills are often things that are held by institutions, by organisations, and not necessarily by individuals. We often think of skills as being a highly individualised thing, but skills are things which are held by networks of people and, and uh, organisational interactions, which become more regular and the capacity increases. And that's actually what upskilling and reskilling can look like on the ground. So when you're dealing with economies that have large uh, amounts of informal uh, enterprises and informal employment that engaging with those and building their capacity and strengthening them and, and to some extent formalizing them that's actually what upskilling and reskilling is going to look like in practice right thank you so much dominic and we have come to the end of this session we only have two minutes left and i will just do a quick round off of the most of some of the important points that have been made today um so one thing that we have talked about uh chamaka we lost you And then um, we've also mentioned that Chamaka, studies have stated that there is, yes. Chema, we, we lost you for a second. So if you could uh, do your um, roundup again, please. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, thank you. Okay, perfect. So I said to round up some of the most important points, um, first of all, we need to, um, it has been stated that green um, jobs will create new employment opportunities. And it's important that even in creation of new employment opportunities, we're also thinking about revamping the currently existing models to make them greener and more sustainable. And then we've also um, uh, mentioned that there is actually an excess supply of labor at every skill level. So the workforce is there to be absorbed into these new sectors and then we have also talked about the fact that um, there are new innovative uh, medium to small enterprises and young people doing green jobs and um, carrying out green businesses at various levels and they need finance and more support and investment and we've also talked about the importance of the large informal economy the importance of upskilling as well as collaborating with that informal economy to bring about the results that we're looking at so um thank you everyone for being part of this and mete has a last comment which is important that green jobs are not automatically decent jobs so while we promote green jobs we're also looking at the fact that they have to be decent employment especially for people who are vulnerable such as women internally displaced people people with disabilities thank you everyone once again for coming we're over by one minute um, um but i think we've had a very insightful discussion this is just the first of six we're going to be having one next week at the same time and i hope to see everyone there again as well. Thank you to all the moderators and all our audience for participating. Have a very good evening. Bye. Thank you very much.